welcome back to another episode of a very British space program. You find us mid-launch. This is the 6th of October 1963 and we are launching the first of a Hesperus 4 craft. This is one bound for Mercury and it is called Messenger 1. Um, you will also notice that it's launching on uh, a new newish craft. It, it looks like a, a Blue Knight. This is actually a Blue Knight 2. It's got increased lifting capability. It can take 20 tons to low Earth orbit. And on top of it, we have a, a new transfer stage. That's the uh, Intermediate Transfer Stage, or ITS, as we shall call it. Um, and this is going to replace the old Hesperus 3 transfer stage. It's a purpose-made craft that can actually push things into orbit for us. And this is going to remain in orbit for a couple of days prior to departure. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a way forward for us. So, please, like, subscribe if you're interested. And uh, with that, I think we should get going, don't you? Right, so it is the 8th of October 1963 and Messenger 1 is departing for Mercury. Um, this craft is the first of a hopefully a set of craft that we're actually going to be sending out of the uh, the Hesperus 4 variety. Uh, it's, we're actually calling them messengers because, you know, it's, it's good for the, the international community public eye if it doesn't have the name Hesperus attached to it after the slight issue we had. So the intermediate transfer stage does most of its burning and then we're just going to basically do a little bit of uh, refinement using RCS to try and get this craft onto a nice path to uh, to Mercury. And this will be our first visit to Mercury. So a little bit of RCS uh, movement there. You'll see that the craft has uh, a magneto boom on one side and we have to counterbalance that with um, a chunk on the other side, I think I believe is some batteries actually. Um, it's uh, It's got a much larger dish on it than the old Hesperus crafts. Um, it's got a longer range on it. This thing potentially, with a few upgrades to our own uh, communication system on Earth, should be able to communicate out as far, not as far as Pluto, but from most of the planets. So, you know, we've got a good range on there. And you can see there we're just refining our orbit with some RCS just to bring it down into a nice sort of location around Mercury. This is not going to capture, but we might get a few flybys. So we will see. So, with that we have another launch. So, this is uh, the 14th of October 1963 and we are launching Messenger 2. This is another one of our Hesperus 4 craft, again on, an, uh, on a Blue Knight 2 booster. And this one is heading to Uranus. That sounds terrible. Can't believe I've said that. Yeah, Uranus? Is that, is that what the Americans say? The Americans say Uranus, don't they? They're going to Uranus. Um, uh, but it's going to spend some time in orbit. It's actually going to spend a few weeks uh, in orbit before departure. Um, primarily because we're getting a bit of a backlog, backlog on the pad. You can see these two craft have actually gone out quite quickly uh, after each other. Um, we've got a lot of interplanetary departures coming. Um, we've got a lot of these craft basically lined up to be released. And, and one of the big issues in the last episode where we had the Mars missions and we needed to do the cash mission was because we actually needed money to launch these things. We've, we've got the money to build them. We just didn't have the money to launch some of them. So we've, we've now got that. We can actually get them going. So that's going to head up. It's going to spend some time there. And 8th of November 1963, this is a monumentous day. It is the launch of the UK's first space capsule. That's right, we've decided that actually capsules might be something we want to look at. So this has been developed by the, uh, the team led by James Arthur Chamberlain, previously of Avro Canada, following his time working at Imperial College London. Um, we must say, we you know I've mentioned this before, NASA tried to poach a number of the Avro Canada team, in particularly uh, James, uh, and uh, we, well, we feel the Commonwealth likes to stick together on this one, and so they were more than happy when they saw the pay packet available from us to actually join us. Obviously, Avro being originally a subsidiary of a British company, um, and their and, and their ties to the UK and to the the Empire the Commonwealth, not the Empire of the Commonwealth. Um, they, uh, they decided it was more than acceptable to come and join us. So this is Faraday Flight 1 or uh, Flight F001. And this is just going to be a short orbital test of the craft uh, prior to longer duration and rendezvous potentially in, in future missions. So the research on this craft is a uh, zodiacal light photography, orbit maneuvering, and um, it, it's, it's hopefully going to use some, some stuff for rendezvous in the next uh, missions and some simple navigation and the crew our crew today is uh, Jane Marsh, who was the is the first of our second class of astronauts to actually uh, to enter into flights. 
Um, she was the test, one of the test pilots for the Javelin 3A. Uh, I think she flew the second of those. And then we've also got Janet Payne, who was the last member of the, who's the last member of that second astronaut admissions class to actually head into space. This is her first mission in space. Um, so we, we did get quite high G on our second stage there. And um, the concern was that, um, you know, that might be too much for the crew. So we are aware of that and we've, um, we're gonna probably have to look at shutting off some engines in future, um, potentially. We'll have to have a look at that. So the idea of this is that capsules are potentially a lot quicker for us. They're a lot quicker turnaround and they actually take a less uh, launch pad for us to get them up. And they're a little bit more sort of uh, nimble, shall we say. So we're hopefully, going to combine this this is not the end of our space plane program though it's merely just a, an alternative so the the faraday ever faraday one basically just orientates itself in orbit having a look at its booster stage and things like that um they they basically do a little bit of station keeping and things like that and then they just you know enjoy a little flight around the planet um when they approach about a day in orbit they're going to start preparing themselves for um for reducing their periaps a little bit and preparing for re-entry. And that's that's basically what we're gonna go for. So after about, you know, almost a day in orbit, it's about 20, 23 hours in actual fact, they uh, they reposition the craft, reorientate it, fire off those engines. So these are the basically the improved engines that we had on the, the test vehicle, the, the Faraday X. Um, we've put the, the final choice the engines on there and we're still not sure about them actually. We think we, we, we may not need as much thrust as they produce so we may actually end up cutting that down but for now the Faraday 1 will be using these engines. Um, you notice we decouple our little service module there so now we are basically on internal power or on internal life support. We're on internal RCS control. So there we go, we're gonna orientate the craft and prepare for re-entry. We've got a, a standard uh, developed heat shield on this one, unlike the test craft that didn't have one and decided to explode. Um, and here we are coming in through the atmosphere, nice and easy. And of course, this is our first crewed capsule return. We've never actually had a capsule return before. You can see the crew are obviously very happy about it. Um, the uh, the return is actually reasonably hot. We had a little bit of, of, of heat on re-entry, but nothing too bad. The crew was okay. Again, this is our first generation of of uh, of heat shields and then it comes down nicely landing down into a bit of some deserty planes all done wonderful rescued off they go right so now we have the launch of another craft and this this looks familiar again but it's actually an old rocket this is actually a it's it's a blue knight one uh, we, we're not using a Blue Knight 2 for this. This is not uh, the Messenger 3 as it could have been. It is uh, happening before the launch of Messenger 3, before even the departure of Messenger 2. This is another one of our commercial payloads to geostationary orbit, this time a weather satellite. Obviously being British, we, we love our weather and people are willing to pay for us to put weather satellites up. We're more than willing to do that. Again, it's going to use the Newton 1 satellite bus. This thing is just a, an old workhorse for us now. Um, we did identify a slight problem with avionics on the second stage, but that's partly due to inactive payload avionics. So we need to be aware of that for future future reference. So um, there are plans for the uh, the construction of, of alternative uh, payload facilities uh, in the UK. So we may end up with some of our commercial craft actually launching from the Northern Hemisphere in the future. However, that is also the base of our um, manned program at the moment um and so there's a debate there as to where actually the bigger the biggest sort of uh, load is for for launches um uh, we do have a split at the moment where we've got a large amount of uh, sort of interplanetary missions coming from the australian site and all of our manned stuff is basically coming out of out of the uk and then we're basically juggling our commercial requirements either side so anyway we're doing our little transfer to geostationary orbit you can see there that uh, it is in the dark because it always seems to be in the dark doesn't it um we use the first stage fire it off and then the second stage just finishes off that burn getting us into that transfer orbit and then we're going to do a uh, a little um circularization there at uh, at apple apps at our um at our ascending node as we always do um hopefully uh, we can actually get it into the correct location. Um, what we will probably do is actually look for where the specific location is and then we put it into a, uh, a higher orbit to allow us to move locations once we've actually circularized. Um, 
we do have time to do this uh, in reality what you'd actually want to do is you know knock it out of fears by a few minutes um, and then just let it work its way around the planet and then when you're in the right location just put it back into its its geostationary orbit it's not a difficult task to do so there we go we've we've actually overshot a bit we got to the right position so we need to at this point just reorientate a little bit fire the engines there we go just get us into the right position we're roughly right and then we're just going to rotate around until we're above the right place so you can see there we're just we're not actually quite geostationary we're allowing ourselves an orbit it takes a little longer which means that uh, after a few circles so cycles round the planet this thing will basically be able to circularize itself there we go uh to sort that out take it up a bit more we're going to go around the planet a few times here we go and you can see that our other geostationary craft have actually gone past us. They're going a little faster, we're going slower. So in reality, the Earth's spinning underneath us and we get to the point where we're above our target. We zero out our thing, everything's good. Zero out our inclination as well, because this wants a very specific, you know, equatorial inclination, you need to sort that out. So we get to zero, circular is everything out perfectly. Mission should be good, using the last few drips and drops of fuel in the tank and i think we've just about got it and this this mission actually was a bit of a fiddle for us if i must admit it with the previous one was almost perfect and this one took a little bit of fiddling so we just have to hold our position right so it is flight f002 on the 27th of november 1963 this is another faraday one an exact copy of the last one this time we have in the pilot seat veteran pilot kim jarvis of famed first flight into orbit and everything like that and she is alongside rookie flight engineer lisa robinson who is the second member of our third astronaut class to fly um, they're going to be carrying out the the first crewed rendezvous with another craft hopefully in this uh, in this mission and that's going to be with Puk 2 good old Puk 2 that we put up for our original robotic rendezvous we're going to use the the things we learned from that mission combined with the tests that we had with this capsule in the previous mission in in f001 so we now know how long it can stay in orbit we know how it can behave in orbit and we know pretty much what we've got available to us on this on this craft so um we do have a limit of about 23 hours on this craft. We, could, we can last a day in orbit. Um, we do have fuel limits as well. So we're trying to actually launch into the plane of Puk-2, which would, shouldn't be too hard because it took a normal profile from Spade Adam and we're launching from Spade Adam. It is just a case now of catching up with Puk. So this craft will do a little burn, pull itself out uh, and, and do a, a little sort of Hoffman transfer to meet up with Puck 2 what it actually does is actually increases its its orbit so that it actually can uh, can go can can slow down Puck 2 can close up and then it will actually try and do a Hoffman sort of meeting and you can see here we're actually just doing a little bit of a burn there just to align our orbits at their encounter point this took about four hours so it took about four hours to actually get a close encounter that's partly with us just traveling around the planet this is not a bad encounter actually you know getting getting an encounter in four hours is not bad around the earth could have been worse but anyway so we do our little burn we find our orbit and uh, you know luckily we're actually coming around in the sunlight and you can see here we're firing off the rcs because what we're trying to do is actually zero out our velocity as we come closer to our targets so you see there we're using the forward rcs ports just to slow us down just to make sure that we don't have any odd jumping around and, 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 and missing our target and then what we're going to try and do is just bring ourselves in closer so we're going to turn ourselves and we're going to use the main engines on the back there we don't really want to use them too much but we're going to use them as a braking stage for the last minute so we've used our assets to bring us alongside then we're going to fire the uh, the main engines so that just zeroes out and now it's about it's about kim basically taking over the stick and doing this for us she's going to be the one that is going to be orientating and positioning this craft exactly where we want you'll notice we do not have the um ses functionality of fixed nodes and stuff kim is doing this by eye because she is that sort of girl she's she's doing that sort of stuff and you come in and just parks it right next to Puck. Look at that. They're just having a really good look at the satellite. Just, you know, they're, they're obviously not aware of the radioactive material actually attached to that satellite that uh, 
could potentially be a problem for them. No, they're, they're quite happy, I suppose, to be fair, they're probably being irradiated in space as it is, so it doesn't really matter too much, does it? Um, so they have a good look, and one of they actually do now, they spend the next few hours, they spend about 12 hours just undertaking the experiments on power tools and things like that that they've got on there with them, and also just station keeping. So they're gonna pull away from Puck, they're gonna move towards Puck, they're gonna, gonna hold station for a while, and then they're just gonna also monitor after a few hours of that, they're gonna monitor just generally the rate of drift, the rate of movement from perceived zero, because they can they can perceive movement slightly between the two craft, but is there gonna be sort of drift due to gravitational flux and all these sorts of interesting little things? So they're just gonna do this station keeping for a while, and then they're gonna let themselves just drift away as they prepare to carry out their return from orbit. So, return from orbit, of course, gonna go okay. They enter into the into the upper atmosphere, they dispense of their service module. It was quite low down when they dispensed of it, so, you know, we are, we are holding onto it for longer and longer right now. Um, and they're gonna come down in through the atmosphere. We're just checking what we've got, making sure we've got enough of the RCS. Obviously, there is uh, previous missions where um, RCS was a problem for the craft. We're actually testing different orientations here. We're gonna try a bit of a descent mode, so we're actually tilting the craft upon entry into the atmosphere. And there you go. We're using the RCS just to hold the craft in a certain position while we've rebalanced the weight. This is descent mode. Um, Apollo did this, and a lot of craft actually do this. They put a slight tilt on it, and it allows the surface of the, the bottom surface of the craft to act as a bit of a, um, a Faraday wing almost. I believe it's a Faraday wing, which is ironic, because this is a Faraday. Anyway, yeah, this is a this is where the name comes from obviously of the Faraday wing on the bottom of the craft and um, we you know we, we get a little bit of reheating heating on the on the on the shield at the bottom there you can notice we're getting a little bit of heat on the uh, the actual top of the craft that's building up because we're coming in at that that angle and obviously we can just knock that uh, that unbalanced sort of approach off and it will allow that to cool down once it's in the shielding of the of the craft by by doing that and so there we are just coming down through the atmosphere detach the outer sort of shroud and then the parachutes are available and then it's just a case of those parachutes popping out so there we go out they go and we're going to drift down now so as the crew of flight f002 faraday one come in to splash down um until next time have a great one